Thank you for your patience and cooperation. The boarding will begin in a few moments. Hello YouTube and welcome, Frick here, and I have a new flight for you in my Let's Play Flight Simulator X FS Passengers Season 2 video series for you. In this flight, we are going to be differentiating from what we did in Episode 1, which was that flying tour type of flight, which means we are going to go back to the normal flight type. This means that we will leave from a departure airport and go to a new arrival airport. Thus, in this flight, we are going to be leaving the airport that we are at, which is the beautiful and lovely KGYI. North Texas Regional Airport, Perrin Field in Sherman, Denison, Texas, and we're going to be heading north-northwest to a relief airport of Will Rogers Airport, which is in Oklahoma City, as we're going to be landing in K-O-U-N, or the University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport in Norman, Oklahoma, which is just southeast of Oklahoma City. We're heading up that way with the hopes to eventually start flying west into Colorado, over the Rocky Mountains, into California, and up to Oregon. However, that is all in the future. We live in the present. Let's talk about what we have to do right now to get this aircraft ready for flight with passengers to Oklahoma City. As you can hear by that whine in the background noise, my batteries are on. This can be verified by looking at my battery switches right here and you can see that they are on the on position. I have these on so I can have my instrument panel lighting on which you can see right there and also my overhead dome lighting on, which you can see right here. That dome lighting is what is giving my aircraft this kind of blood reddish hue. However, with the batteries being on, it is draining a lot of battery power, and this game is not very forgiving with how long your batteries can last. So before I rant about anything more, I want to get my engine started so I can use alternator power to power my electrics instead of just my battery. So without further ado, let's hit the checklist. As always, if you want to follow along with the checklists, I have a link to the checklist that I am using in the description box below, and I do encourage you, if you are unfamiliar with checklists or want to follow along, to follow along. Also, as always, I'm going to be skipping the pre-flight checklist, as so many of the items in there I cannot do because this is a video game. I cannot sump the fuel out of the tanks to check for contaminants, or I can't check the tire pressure. This is because it is a video game, not real life. If I could go into the video game like in Tron, maybe, I would do so. However, I would probably not fly that way because I have a tendency to crash into trees, and if I were to crash into a tree in the video game, I would probably die, and then I would probably die then in real life, I am assuming. Kind of like the Matrix, and I don't want that to happen. So... We are going to assume for simulation sake that the pre-flight inspection is completed. We're going straight into the startup checklist. Startup checklist. Avionics power switch off. We can see that it is off. Beacon and nav lights on. Beacon light as always is on, but we'll turn on the nav light right there. Circuit breakers, we want to make sure that they are pushed in. However, they're hidden behind these yokes. So I'm going to remove these yokes, throw them out the window. I'm not going to bring them back for the rest of the flight. So I'm going to be flying this aircraft through ESP or mind control or the force or something like that. Anyway, these circuit breakers are all pushed in. If one was pushed out, I could do nothing about it because they are non-interactable buttons because this is a video game and not real life. Fuel selector valve desired tank. It is showing that it is on all or both, meaning that it is drawing fuel from both tanks. This is a glitch with this aircraft. This fuel selector is only a left tank or right tank only selector. However, I'm going to pretend that I have great engineering and mechanical skills and that I modified this selector to draw fuel from both tanks. Carb heat, we want to make sure that that is in the off or cold position, which you can see it is right there. Also, I got a suggestion from one of you fine viewers suggesting that every flight I talk about a let's learn topic or some kind of aeronautical topic or piece of information that you guys can hear in which I can educate you more about planes or aeronautical topics or equipment and stuff like that. So in this flight, I am going to be talking about the carb heat. However, I'm not going to be talking about it right now. I'm going to wait till we're in the air. I want to leave you at the edge of your seats in a cliffhanger. As you can see, I've been ranting too long and my batteries have also died. This means that I am going to have to restart my simulation to get battery power back. I will be back in one second. Alright everybody, I am back. As you can see, that is how fast your batteries die in this game. I started my batteries right before I started recording, so that 
is how quickly they can die in the game. Kind of unrealistic, I think. However, regardless, we're back in a new aircraft with a new battery. And I am basically in the point of the checklist that I left off. So I've gone through my avionics power switch off beacon. Nav lights are on. Except for my nav light. I never turned that on. Circuit breakers are in. Fuel selector valve is on both. Carb heat is off. Mixture. We want to put that all the way to full rich right there. And I'm going to crack my throttle to about of a quarter of an inch in. Uh, next thing we can do is brakes. We want to make sure that they are test and set again. I'm not going to get out of my aircraft, push on my aircraft to make sure that my brakes are working. I'm going to do my brake check during the taxi. However, my parking brake is on. It shows verified down here in this little red thing. Next thing we need to do is propeller area, clear it. To do this, I am not going to open my door by hitting shift E. Instead, I'm going to use the door handle. What a novel idea to use a door handle to open a door instead of a keyboard shortcut. Anyway, the door is open. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to yell outside, all clear, all clear because I want to make sure that no one standing in front of my aircraft gets chopped up into itty bitty pieces when I turn on my engine. So the propeller area is clear. Master switches are on as you can see right there. Electric fuel pump, we're going to go ahead and turn that on right now. That's going to act as our engine primer. Also, if we needed the extra boost, we do have an engine primer down here. However, I'm not going to use it because it is a video game and I'm not going <laughs> to... The plane's going to start right away. Let's, let's be real. Anyway... In real life, if the engine was struggling on starting, you could use your engine primer like that to give it a little extra boost in fuel. Next thing we're going to do is turn the ignition switch on. So here we go. As you can see, my ignition switch is on. My propeller is spinning. My tachometer is rising. I'm at about almost a thousand RPM. All my gauges are coming to life. As you can see, everything is starting to come up into the green. However, my oil pressure is a little low. That is just because I'm so close to idle. If I were to pull up my throttle, you will see that slowly increase. However, I don't want my throttle to be in that much. I just want it to be at about 1,000 RPM. Even though this is a video game, I could pull it all the way to idle. However, in real life, you would keep your throttle up a little bit because you want your engine to warm up. You want your fluids inside there, such as your oil, to get a little loose and to warm up. So, for realism's sake, I am going to keep my throttle at that 1,000 RPM range. Oil pressure and all the other gauges want to make sure that they are all in the green, which they are. Next thing I can do is turn off my fuel pump because I don't need it anymore. I don't need to be priming my engine while it is started and getting fuel. Also, what I can do now is turn on my avionics panel. You can see my avionics came to life. Here's my DME. And also my enunciator lights are now to life. And I can hit this button to test it and you can see it all right there. Next, before we start setting our frequencies, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into FS passengers and let's set up a flight. So FS passengers and start flight. There are two passengers who are ready and willing to fly with us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into there and I'm going to add those two passengers to my flight. So I have one pilot, two passengers. Let's view the passengers. We have the 71-year-old Isaac Ransom. And hopefully he's not a terrorist that holds me for ransom. Bromching. We also have the 49-year-old Clifford K. Both of them are at relatively decent or healthy weight, so... Good job, you guys. We're going to keep it at that. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move my luggage up to 200 pounds because according to the pilot operating handbook, this aircraft is able to carry 200 pounds of luggage in the cargo hold. I have seen other FS passengers let's play videos where they bump that luggage all the way up to the full extent because you get more money for the more luggage you carry. However, again, I am trying to go for realism's sake here. So I'm not going to exceed 200 pounds in my cargo hold, hold because the aircraft does not recommend you do that. So I'm going to leave it at 200 pounds. However, these passengers probably only have about 10 to 20 pounds of luggage each. So that means we have around 160 pounds of outside cargo. Well, for this flight, I am going to pretend that Oklahoma City is in a cabbage shortage. So what we are going to do is we're going to try to get some cabbage from Sherman, Texas up to Oklahoma City for them because they are in dire need of cabbage. So that is what the other 160 pounds of cargo is going to be. You can see that my current fuel load is about 90%, so I'm going to bump that all the way up to 100% and hit advanced fuel, and we can see that we have a 100% in both tanks. So we'll leave it at that. Also, you can see my aircraft current load is at 89%. That means we're under load, which means we could carry more weight if we wanted to. But that is because we have room for one more passenger. 
However, I am not going to bump up my luggage till I get my aircraft current load to 100%. I am just not going to do that. I am going to follow the pilot operating handbook like a good little pilot. Scout's honor. Set destination. Let's go ahead and do that right now. We're going to go to K-O-U-N, which you can see is University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport. So let's go ahead and okay that. Destination. Thank you, British lady. Set type. We're going to make sure that this is a normal flight, which means that we're going from one departure A airport to a new point B arrival airport. So it is a normal flight. So we have our type set. We have our destination set. I'm not going to mess with the flight and aircraft settings. I don't need help. 200 pounds of luggage, two passengers, one pilot, 100% fuel. All our checks are looking good. So let's go to OK real-time load. It's going to take two minutes for those people to get on board. Also, I have to hit Shift E to open the door, but I already did it with a door handle. Pilot data sheet and load manifest. I don't need to really worry about this because not much has changed. Center of gravity is off of that of the default one Cessna, our default Cessna 172 that we flew in our first season, but whatever, it is still good. All of this is looking good. It's a little heavier than it was last flight. That is because of our 200 pounds of cargo or 199 pounds according to this, whatever, close enough to 200 pounds. Let's go ahead and start the flight. So we have two passengers who are currently coming onto the plane. My door is open. I'm going to move this up here so I don't have to look at it. Next thing I'm going to do is come down to my avionics panel. We want to make sure our frequencies are set. So we have 122.70 set for the first one. That is the CTAF frequency for this airport. In real life now, it is no longer a CTAF. It is a towered airport now. However, in the video game that was created about 10 plus years ago, it was no towered airport at the time so that means uh we have to use a ctaf frequency or common traffic advisory frequency which means we're not going to have atc deconfliction with other aircraft from tower we have to deconflict with ourselves through the ctaf frequency also 118.77 is the asos frequency which is where we're going to get our weather and other information 124.75 is going to be fort worth center which is going to be the first center that we are going to contact once we depart this airport next let's set up our vors the first vor navigation that i'm going to go to is that of the ardmore vr and that frequency is 116.7. So let's go ahead and set that 116.7. And the other frequency I'm going to be setting is that of Will Rogers Airport, which is 114.1. Now that VOR is actually about 10 miles away to the northwest of the airport that we're going to be landing at. So if I go directly to that VOR, I am not going to go to the airport that I want to go to. So... We have to do some other kinds of navigation with that. Luckily, I also have a GPS to keep me honest. One of the nice trade-offs of this aircraft is I have GPS. Yes, it sucks I don't have autopilot, but GPS has also proved to be nice. Especially since this flight, right now I have it at 10 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night. Which means it's going to be pretty dark when we get to Will are not Will Rogers, but uh, University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport. So the GPS is also going to be nice in that sense to make sure that we are ensure correctly landing at the right airport next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to fasten my seatbelt sign because my passengers are in and i'm going to close my door using this fancy little door handle pre-taxi and taxi checklist just make sure all this is good flaps we want to make sure they are in the up position i pushed my button to make sure they're up but also my flaps are here and you can see they're at the zero percent detent so they are up avionics and radios we want them set uh, which we just did. Transponder, we got to turn that to standby. My transponder is right here. And that first switch right there, I'll bring you closer so you can see. Right there is standby. It was in off. Now we're in standby. The next thing we have to do is get our ASOS information, which is going to be our weather. So let's flip to our standby frequency and make it the active.
All right, so we have our information, and I think the weather uh, tower for this area is dead because that is not the real world weather. That is like perfect weather, but it is two nine or nine or two for the altimeter, which is about right there. Altimeter. Altimeter. Oh, if I hit B, it also adjusts the altimeter, and uh, altimeter. it says altimeter. That's kind of cool. Uh, also, our altimeter is set. Sky is clear, there are no clouds really. You can see some off into the distance, but we're gonna be heading more th that way, and it is still relatively clear. You can see the sun is setting. We have our information, ATIS information altimeter is set. Then the last things in the pre-taxi and taxi checklist are test and set the brakes, compass, altitude, and heading and turn indicators, uh, and things like that. In order to do that, what we have to do is uh, be moving, but we can see that our heading indicator is showing north and our magnetic compass is showing north. That is working. We'll make sure that those stay relatively aligned. Also, when we're in our uh, taxi, we can check our turn coordinator to make sure that is working and our artificial horizon to make sure that is working as well as our brakes. Lastly, landing and taxi lights. We want to make sure they're as required. Well, I don't have taxi lights. I'm going to get penalized for this. However, I am not going to turn on my landing lights because they would get mad at me for turning on my landing lights and using them as taxi lights. However, that is what you would do in an aircraft like this where your taxi light is your landing light. However, the game FS Passengers is not smart enough to recognize this. There is nothing I can do about it. I'm going to hit Control P and I'm going to start my taxi. There are no aircraft to my left, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull a quick U-turn. If you remember in my last video, I tried to customize some of the, the penalties that I could get by uh, making it a little more realistic. So I disabled flaps on takeoff. That is kind of a stupid penalty. If you don't have flaps on takeoff, you get penalized. Well, with a small GA aircraft like this and these long of runways, I don't need to use flaps on the takeoff. I can just develop enough ground speed to lift off. I don't need to do a short field takeoff or anything like that. Holy cow. I am starting to taxi and I forgot to announce that I am going to taxi. This is a CTAF frequency. We don't have ground frequencies or ground permissions from ground or tower. So we actually have to announce it ourselves and I completely forgot. Good thing I never got too far. So what I'm going to do is I got to select a runway for takeoff. We're going to be using runway 31 because the runway conditions are clear. Uh, so I'm going to select that one uh, and that's going to have us take off pretty much to the north. And now I can announce my taxi. This is gonna make sure that no one crashes into me. So don't do what I do if you're on a CTAF frequency, a non-towered airport, and not announce your uh, taxi or any of your intentions. That's bad. You want to announce everything. You want other aircraft to know what you are doing because you are responsible for de-conflicting with them. All right, we'll follow this lovely little line right here. And we are going to turn left right here. This is going to be Taxiway Alpha, according to my airport diagram, which you guys can't see because it is on my other display. However, you saw it last flight, episode one of season two, and we are doing the exact same thing. That means we are going to pass Taxiway Echo, which crosses uh, runway 31, and we're also going to pa pass Taxiway Foxtrot which crosses runway 31 as well. Alpha will continue south until it turns right and goes directly to the end of runway 31. So that is going to be our taxi instructions. I'm sorry if the taxi is a little bored or boring. The taxi is kind of the most boring part. At least I'm only having to traverse half of the runway instead of all of it. I've done other flights where I have to go on a taxiway all the way down the entire distance of the runway, and that is kind of boring. If I could teleport us there, I still probably would not do that because if I could teleport, why wouldn't I just teleport us to the airport that we're going to? Then I wouldn't have to fly. That wouldn't make any sense. That would mean that this video would be all for naught, and I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to teleport us in any shape manner or form we're just gonna have to endure the taxi however it's probably gonna be another minute and a half of taxi so I'll just cut the video right here and bring you back when we're at the end of this taxiway welcome back ladies and gentlemen we are nearing the end of this taxiway as you can see we're coming up to that right turn which I mentioned that we would have to encounter earlier 
and that is going to take us straight to runway 31 where we can get ready for our departure to KOUN. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly start taking this turn, hopefully staying on the lines, even though I cannot see them. But I'm not going on the grass, and I must be close to the line. Oh, it's a little inside me now. There it is. I can still see the line. We're doing good. And right here, as you can see, we're on taxiway Alpha, and we're coming up on runway 31 right. Which is where we're going to be landing at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slow myself, and once I get to that hold short line, we are going to run through our engine run-up. I'm going to pull back my throttle and start to hit the brakes. And there we go. We are at the hold short line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit control period and we can start our engine run up. So brakes are set and hold. Seatbelt and harnesses. Seat backs are in the upright lock position. Tray tables up. Cabin doors and windows are closed and latched. Making sure I close this one, which I did. Flight controls are free and correct. I'm moving my yoke, but you can't see it because I threw it out the window. So I'm, because I'm actually flying this through ESP and mind control. Primer, we want to make sure that's in and locked because you don't want the engine to suddenly start getting a ton of fuel. Uh, that would not be good uh, when you're in flight. Fuel selector is on the proper tank, which is both with my modified valve selector. Fuel pump is off, mixture is rich or appropriate. What it means by appropriate is if we were in a place, say, Denver, Colorado, where the elevation is about a mile up already, around 6,000 feet, you would already have your mixture leaned back some for the thinner air that is up there. However, we are close to sea level. We're only at about like 900 feet. Well, you can see right here, we're at about 800 feet almost. Uh, in altitude so the air is not thin we can have it fully rich that is why the mixture is at rich elevator and rudder trim we want to make sure that that is set so I come down here and look at it and it is at 10 we want to bring it to about 7% or 7 degrees uh, I can't see 5.4 6.2 6.7 6.9 6 we will leave it right there an unseared panel we can test. We can see one light is on. Again, that is for that oil pressure because we're close to idle. But if I press these buttons, you'll see that the other enunciator lights are working. Autopilot and air conditioner, we want to check that that is off. Well, we don't have an autopilot air conditioner. We do have one of those. It is right here, and they are both off. I'm not going to turn them on anyway because I don't care about my digital passenger's comfort levels. All right, so we do have uh, someone coming in over here to land. I don't see them, but they're coming on runway 17. Regardless, I'm not going to worry about them because I'm not on that runway. Next thing we can do is we can bump up our throttle to about 2,000 RPM. I'm not going to bring it up quite that far because I will start to uh, screech forward somewhat, as you can see. Uh, I'm going to bring it up to about halfway throttle, which is about... 100 RPM and now we can do our run-up checks so first thing I'm gonna check is my magnetos I'm gonna turn to the first one not that way right there you'll see a little about 50 RPM dip which we saw right there so that magneto is working not the one we shut off but the other one and we'll turn down to the other magneto a little dip again and go back to both and it comes up again. So both magnetos are working. Next thing we can test is our carb heat. So I'm gonna turn that on and we'll see about 150 RPM dip. This is because when I apply carb heat, it warms up the air, making it thinner, which means that the gas mixture is a little off because the air is thinner, meaning we lose some RPM. I will discuss this all a little more once we're in the air in my riveting carb heat discussion. So those things are working. Next, we can look at all our gauges, make sure everything is in the green, which is all appearing to be in the green. So everything is working just fine. What I'm going to do then is put my throttle down to about 1,000 RPM again. Flaps, set those for takeoff. 
So I'm gonna set those as in not set those. I'm gonna keep them at where they are, which is not on. A pedo heat, there is no moisture uh, as in clouds right now. So I'm not gonna worry about my pedo heat right now. If we start seeing clouds or any kind of moisture, then I can turn on my pedo heat, but we should be flying low enough where we don't have to worry about pedo tube freezing and we're not gonna be in moisture. So I'm not gonna worry about it as of right now. Heading indicator adjust to compass. Well, we can see that it's pretty much on west and west right here. So our heading indicator is matched to our compass. Transponder, we wanna turn that to alt. So I'm gonna come over here and turn that to alt. And my last thing I'm gonna do is turn my landing light on. So landing light is on, fuel pump off, beacon on, instrument panel light is on, make sure the nav lights are on. So that is all on. So we are ready for takeoff. That is kind of cool. That is a plane with its lights off and a trail, but it kind of looks like a meteorite flying through the sky. There was a plane taking off on runway 17. I do not see them anywhere. Let's try zooming in to see if we can see them. Uh, yeah, I don't see them, so I'm just gonna depart to the north. Kilo Golf, Yankee India, traffic, Papa Hotel, Quebec, zero five, taking off runway three one north departure. So we do not get any kind of clearances again from a tower or ground controller because this is a non-towered airport, meaning I have to do all my deconfliction by myself. I said this before, but I'm just saying it again because it is one of the big key things with a CTAF frequency and a non-towered airport. We are on our runway. All our lights are on. I am not going to go through the takeoff checklist because there are too many things to vocalize at once. However, I'm going to start applying throttle right now and let's go ahead and take off and begin our flight to K-O-U-N or University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport. We're at about 40 knots in airspeed, slowly accelerating. Now we're reaching that 60 knot in airspeed mark. We are still looking quite good. Decision speed is met. Once I hit about 80 knots, I am gonna rotate. Here we go. Pull back on the throttle some, and I've already let go of my uh, yoke. Well, not let go, but released pressure, and you can see that we were trimmed quite well because we are taking off. Because we are gonna be heading to a westerly or northwesterly direction, cruising up VFR altitudes indicate that I should be on a even number plus 500 for my altitude. So I'm gonna shoot for about 4,500 feet in altitude for this flight. We're heading easterly or from degrees of 360 or zero degrees up to about 180 in that easterly direction then we would be on a odd number such as 3000 or 5000 plus 500 however since we're going westerly we're going to be on an even number so about 4000 or 6000 8000 you get the idea plus 500 so we're shooting for 4500 also you can see that it now wants us to tune to fort worth center on 124.75 which i already have set down there however i'm gonna not tune quite yet because i want to make sure that i am fully deconflicted with all the aircraft that are by this airport because i want to make sure i'm not crack crashing into them that would that would be not good most not good also you can see i connected to that first vor so what I want to do is uh, I have a two flag, meaning that's how I get to it, and I need to fly at about a 3-1 heading, and so I'm going to turn to the left some so I can intercept that uh, 310 radial. And we're pretty close to that 310 radial. That should take us pretty much straight to that first VOR, which is the Ardmore VOR. Also must have got wind or something there uh, things shifted a little bit and what I'm gonna do now is tune it to Fort Worth Center so I'm gonna go to COM2 which is down here and I'm gonna request a flight following this means they are gonna give me Fort a new Worth squat Center, code Hotel, and they'll be able to monitor me in the air World travel seven zero three niner contact Fort Worth Center on one two seven point Papa Hotel Quebec zero five Fort Worth Center Squawk one five four two. 
one five four two. I don't know, have to acknowledge that squat code because they are going to see me. In real life, I would acknowledge it, but they're going to right here. You can hear. Three miles northwest of Tango Echo Six Eight Two Thousand Five Hundred Altimeter Three Zero 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 Cessna Eight One Three Zero Zero Zero. So on this plan, if I click that, it pulls up a smaller altimeter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my uh, pressure to three zero zero zero, which is about right there. And I'm going to acknowledge my We are still climbing. We are maintaining VFR flight rules, which means we have to look out our window to make sure we are deconflicted with other aircraft and not crashing into them. There is another meteorite. We must, we must be in a meteor shower or something. Holy cow, there's a big one right there. It's moving very slowly. That must be the one that killed the dinosaurs. Just kidding, that's the sun. I know it's the sun. You don't send me hate mail. Hate mail. I'm not that stupid. I'm just trying to be funny. I'm trying to make sure these are entertaining for you guys. I'm not sure if they are or not. I don't know if you sit and twiddle your thumbs and are bored out of your mind or if you actually like them. From those who have comment, you guys like them, and I appreciate you guys. I love the interactivity, so if you haven't sent me any comments or suggestions or messages or just want to say hi or anything, ask me a question, do whatever, please send me a comment or a message because I love the interactivity between you guys and myself. We are still in our climb. As you can see, we're gaining about 500 feet a minute, and we are roughly at about 3,300 feet. Also, off to our left and off to our right, especially off to our right, you can see the lovely and beautiful Texacoma, I believe is the name of the lake, Texacoma Lake. If I bring over SkyNav, which is right here, I'm going to zoom forward, you're going to lose sound, but I want to make sure I'm flying straight and level. And we are somewhere right around, we took off from this airport, which is North Texas Regional Parent Field, GYI, and we're somewhere around right here. And so you can see Lake, Lake Texacoma right here. I was informed that this actually is a dammed lake. And actually, it's got some really cool history behind it. Apparently, it was formed by some prisoners of war from World War, I believe it was two. Kind of a fun fact. It was World War II because he said they were uh, prisoners from the Rommel campaign in northern Africa. So kind of a cool, interesting fact about Lake Texacomo is uh, created by POWs, one of the first construction projects apparently by POWs uh, in the United States. That's kind of an interesting fact. Little fun fact. We'll bring over uh, Sky Vector again later in our flight to kind of show you our flight plan that we are doing for this. Uh, but right now I just want to make sure that we are climbing and maintaining a good heading and altitude. Actually, we have turned way west as you can see. So what I need to do is I need to start turning to the right. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Stop you. Oh, I'm on the wrong VOR. Look at this. I have connected to the VOR that we need to connect to, which is going to be that uh, Will Rogers VOR. And in order to fly to it, that can't be right. Oh, we're on the wrong one. One, oh, decimal one. Yep, yep. I was connected to another VOR, which was 113.70, and that wanted me to fly to the west, and I knew that wasn't it. So I'm going to start turning north. We're almost to the altitude that we want to be at as well, so I need to start uh, pulling back my throttle ever so... Oh, I'm not going to pull back my throttle yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dip my nose and start to gain airspeed. Because airspeed is good. You don't want to stall. You want to go fast. I don't want to dip that much because I don't want to descend either. But I want to get to around 100 knots of airspeed, which is what I am going to cruise at. That's a, actually a pretty cool bridge right there. I wonder if that's in real life. That would be a fun bridge to cross. One of my favorite bridges I've ever crossed. Uh, if you guys are ever out in the Virginia area, there is a, a bay of the ocean that goes into Virginia called Chesapeake Bay. And there is a thing called the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, which is a series of about three bridges and three tunnels 
and they're all like 15 miles long. And basically, it's a tunnel at portions to allow barges and uh, sea traffic to come into that bay, but it's a bridge or a tunnel that allows passengers or drivers to uh, cross that bay. Oh, uh, it's actually really cool because when you're in the middle of it on a bridge, both ways that you look, you are, you can't see land. It's like you are driving in the middle of the ocean, uh, which is a really cool bridge tunnel. If you guys ever get out to Virginia, I highly recommend that you take a look at it. As you can see, I'm about 4,500 feet. I've been working on building some of my airspeed, which I'm getting right there, and I want to make sure I don't climb. I want to trim my aircraft nicely. I'm going to start pulling back my throttle ever so slightly. There is a lot of traffic on Fort Worth Center. Next, with me basically straight and level at a decent speed, what I need to do is I need to inter intercept this VOR. So I need to start most likely turning to the north. This is going to be for us. 128.1. Hotel Quebec. Always make sure you are listening to ATC to make sure that if they call you, you can uh, do their instructions. Fort Worth Center, Papa Hotel, Quebec 05, with you. Papa Hotel, Quebec 05, Fort Worth Center, Roger, altimeter 3003. 3003, so it changed ever so slightly. Right there. But it was a very slight change, and we are actually descending slightly, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give myself a tiny bit more throttle so I can keep that VSI at level. Also, I made it uh, on this VOR indicator. I basically, I'm, I'm on the two flag right there, which is kind of hard to see. But if I come down here, you can see that it's pointing up. It's a two flag, and I need to almost fly at a 33 or 330 heading in order to intercept that VOR. So I gotta turn to the right some and go towards the north a little more. At about 330, and I'm at 332, I'm gonna level out right there. Next, I'm gonna turn off my passenger seatbelt sign because we are level at 4,500 feet and the passengers get upset and their satisfaction decreases if you leave the passenger seatbelt sign on for too long. Who'd have thunk that? Still passing at Lake Texacoma. We are nice and straight and level. So what I am going to do now is I'm going to pause the video for a little bit. I'm going to fly for a little while and I'm going to bring you guys back. However, when I do, we're going to have a riveting discussion about carburetor heat. I hope you guys are excited. I will see you in a second. All right, everybody, we are back. This blinking is kind of frustrating. It's actually an airport down there, but it gives me the sensation that we're actually turning to the right, even though we are straight and level. It's kind of weird. If you look down here, you can see we're flying straight. But if you look up here, that blinking light that's moving almost makes me feel as if we're, we have some right yaw in it and we're yawing to the right. Regardless, I am back. If you look at our DME, we are 78 miles away from that Will Rogers VOR. If I go to the first other one though, that Ardmore one, you can see we're 11 nautical miles away from it. Also, if I turn my um, uh, VOR indicator, you can see that we're almost directly west of it, or east of it as well, because we have to fly pretty much straight west to get there. So if we pull over Sky Vector, we took off from this airport and we're coming up here, and here is that VOR here is directly east of it, and we're about 11 miles out, so our aircraft is actually about right there. Uh, kind of a cool way to know where you are. That means if we look off to the right, we should see that lake right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to my plane, look out the right, and you can kind of see some water right there, it looks like. So we're, we're pretty much where I said we should be. At this time, though, I said that we are going to have a riveting discussion on carb heat, and I think this is a good time as any to do it. 
You can see that there's a couple planes around me, but they're all either below or higher. There is the moon coming up. That's kind of cool. Nice little view. Also, you can see that the sun is almost completely set. So this is almost entirely going to be a night flight. Down there is that airport that I was mentioning. Regardless, we're not landing at that. I'm going to come back here and make sure that I'm on uh, DME 1. So we're 75 miles away from where we need to go. Anyway, let's talk about carb heat. Anyway, the reason I'm doing this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I got a suggestion from one of you fine viewers that to add even more educational value to these flights, what I should do is I should have a let's learn topic that I talk about each flight. That way it can be either, you know, a piece of equipment or some kind of aeronautical concept or term or something that I can educate you guys on if you're unfamiliar with a piece of equipment. So if you want to hear about a certain piece of equipment or aeronautical term or something like that, send me a suggestion and I'll try to make sure that that gets into one of these let's learn topics while we're in flight. It gives us something to talk about as well. Anyway, the first one that was suggested to me was carb heat because uh, the person who suggested it to me did not know uh, of carb heat, what it was used for, hadn't even really heard of it before. So let's talk about carb heat. Carb heat is found in aircraft with carbureted engines. This is opposed to aircraft that have fuel injected air engines. A carburetor is nothing more than a device that combines air and fuel for internal combustion. This is accomplished by using, using what is called pressure differential to vaporize the fuel and then send, sending that fuel and air mixture to each cylinder through their air intakes. However, in a fuel injected system, the fuel and air do not mix until they reach the cylinder. Both systems do have their benefit. For example, a carbureted engine is easier to start because in fuel-injected engines, they run a higher risk of flooding due to the fuel being directly shot into the cylinders. Also, carbureted systems tend to be a little simpler with less parts and complexity. However, fuel-injected systems are typically more efficient in flight as the mixture between the fuel and the air is more precise than that of carbureted engines. Additionally, fuel-injected engines offer higher monitoring capabilities through EGT probes, which measure the exhaust gas temperature from the cylinders. Because of the higher efficiency, you are more likely to see fuel-injected systems in newer aircraft as they are becoming more and more standard over the carbureted counterpart. Carburetor heat, then, as mentioned earlier, is used in carbureted engines. It is used to melt or prevent the buildup of ice that can form in the throat or the venturi of a carburetor. It is accomplished by allowing air to bypass the induction filter and heat up by flowing around the exhaust and then traveling into the carburetor. Because in carbureted engines, Pressure differential is used to vaporize fuel. Air inside the carburetor gets cooled due to the reduced pressure. We can illustrate this by, uh, let's think of a can of pressurized spray air that you use to clean out the dust from a computer or other electrical device. You know those cans that you can get at Walmart for like three bucks or something? When you squeeze the trigger to let air out, pressure within that can is decreased quickly because air is shooting out of the nozzle. If you continue to squeeze the trigger, blowing air out constantly, you ultimately reduce the pressure inside of that can very quickly. When you do this, I don't know if you guys noticed, but that can can get colder and colder to the point where it sometimes can get quite cold. Uh, this is the same concept behind a carburetor developing ice. It's that loss of pressure. This reduced pressure in the past in, excuse me, this reduced pressure in and past the venturi or throat of the carburetor can cause temperature to decrease below freezing. Since air contains moisture, this moisture can then turn into ice inside the carburetor. This buildup of ice inside the carburetor will decrease engine performance by restricting the flow of air to the engine. The buildup can get so severe, if not addressed, that the engine can have cylinders misfire or even have the engine quit completely. To counteract this, we use what is called carb heat, or that little button or uh, switch right there. 
This is used to melt that ice or prevent the buildup of ice. However, carburetor heat also comes with a small price in the form of engine performance reduction as well. This is because the hotter air is thinner than that of the cooler air. Thus, when performing the engine run-up like we did earlier in this flight, we tested that carb heat. We saw that there was roughly 150 RPM drop in the tachometer due to the hotter, thinner air being introduced into the carburetor. Engine performance can get rougher when carb heat is applied and ice is present as well as the ice that is in there starts to melt and higher level levels of moisture in the fuel air mixture become present. However, always remember that this payoff of using the carburetor heat is necessary as carburetor icing can decrease engine performance or have even greater consequences, much more than that of what simple car heat does. Now I'm sure at this point you are curious as to when you are most likely to experience carburetor icing, so that you can know when to use carburetor heat. Well, uh, carburetor icing is most likely to occur in temperatures below 70 degrees Fahrenheit when the air is higher in humidity. However, it can even happen in temperatures up to about 100 degrees or more. Additionally, do not assume it is strictly a cold air event. Remember, carburetor icing is not just because it's cold outside or something like that. It is caused by that pressure differential. Oftentimes, you are more prone to icing on a day where it's 60 degrees out with very, very high humidity than a day where it is 20 degrees out with no humidity. Also remember, carb heat is best used to prevent the buildup of ice. Ensuring ice does not build up at all is much better for the engine than trying to melt ice after it was allowed to build up. I'm gonna quick make sure that we're flying correctly. We're still at 4,500 feet and we're still pretty much on that radial that we wanna be on. Now, a few key times to think about using your carb heat. First, before takeoff. This ensures no ice is present when you want maximum engine performance during your takeoff. However, make sure you do not use your carb heat as it reduces engine performance during takeoff. So don't use your carb heat during the takeoff, only before. Secondly, before power is, re is reduced for long periods, such as a de descent or something like that. This preheats the carburetor and helps prevent ice from forming in the first place. Additionally, use carb heat in prolonged descents or times of prolonged low power. It is also sometimes a good technique to, during these times, apply power to the engine, which will further heat up the carburetor and help melt ice or prevent the buildup of ice. So if you're in a long descent, uh, you could apply more power every periodically, which is gonna warm up the engine, build up your RPM. Uh, which is also going to help assist in the prevention of ice building up in the carburetor. Now a few things to consider with carb heat. First, remember to use it prior to times where you need that engine performance, not during, because carb heat does lower some of your engine performance. So for example, before takeoff or before landing, you would use it prior to those events. However, do not use it during these events as you want the maximum engine performance. This even includes landing, just because there may be a time where you need to do a go around and suddenly need to increase the throttle to a maximum where you need more performance from your engine. Also, we never talked about the mixture control, you know, the red knob right here when using carb heat, but remember that if applying carb heat is resulting in a significant loss of power or roughening of the engine, this is significantly more so, or that is significantly more so than normal. Like normally you do, as I had said, experience some uh, engine performance loss. So if I were to turn this on right now, you're gonna see a little decrease in RPM. Also what this is gonna do is you're gonna see that my VSI is slowly gonna drop because my RPM is a little lower, which means I'm slightly gonna descend. However, if I turn it back on, you're gonna see that my RPM is gonna come back and my VSI is gonna bump back up right there. 
Uh, but you can see when I turned it on, I did lose a little bit of altitude. That is because you do lose some engine performance when using it. That means the engine is running a little rougher. I'm losing some performance. However, if it is significantly... Sig uh, excuse me, I can't talk significantly more than usual. Remember to open the throttle, which means to push it in and pull out the mixture control far enough to smooth out your engine. This is because the ice inside the carburetor is melting and introducing moisture to the mix. Additionally, the air is warmed and thinner and is receiving too much fuel in the mixture. To remedy this, you pull back the mixture to reduce the fuel amount in that mixture. Then, as the ice starts to melt, I am starting to turn some that I gotta pay attention to. Anyway, as the ice melts, then you can slowly begin to restore the mixture control back to its original position. Finally, remember that all of this information that I just gave you is kind of generalized information and that every single airport or airplane is different. Uh, and because of this, read your pilot operating handbook if you're flying in a real plane uh, to learn what is best for your plane in regards to carburetor heat. Anyway, that is a little ditty about carb heat. I hope you guys like this little let's learn topic. I hope you were informed a little more or learned a little something about carb heat and or carbureted engines, fuel injected engines, and just flight in general. That is kind of my whole point behind introducing these little let's learn topics. Some of them will be a little more technical than others. I'll try not to make them too technical because I don't want to uh, completely bore you guys. But if you're interested in real flight instead of just simulated flight, it is good to learn some of these topics. But remember again, this is general information. Um, it's different per aircraft and also read up on yourself because I might make a mistake uh, in what I am teaching you as well. I am not a perfect pilot by any means and I want to make sure that you guys are backing me up and researching yourself if you want me to learn about something. Anyway, that is a little ditty about carburetor heat. With that, I am going to cut the video again. I will bring you back in a little bit and when I do, we will talk about the flight plan that we are using for this flight. Welcome back guys. Uh, another thing I wanted to show you, let's talk a little bit about the flight plan, plan that I am using for this flight. As you could see, we, uh, I'm bringing over Sky Vector here. As you can see, we took off from basically Sherman Denison. We crossed this Lake Texacoma and we took off from this airport right here, which is that North Texas Regional Airport right here, KGYI. We started heading right away towards this first VOR, which you can see that circle, whoops, see that circle for it right there, which is that Ardmore VOR, which is right there. And then what we were gonna do is start heading north to northwest, to right here you can see Oklahoma City, and right here is Norman, Oklahoma, and here's the, the airport that we're gonna be landing at, which is that K-O-U-N. So that is the flight plan that we were using. We were connecting to that first Ardmore VR, and then we're gonna head basically northwest to the Oklahoma City, or Will Rogers VR, which is right here. However, if we fly, like I said earlier, directly to that VOR, we are gonna, whoa, I'm turning. I could see the clouds moving. <laughs> it's the problem with not having autopilot. All right, we'll turn back slowly, but if we were to fly directly towards that VOR, uh, we would miss that airport. So what we have to do is we kind of got to navigate and find where we are on a map in relationship to that airport so we can know exactly how to get there. So what I'm going to use right now is I'm going to use this Ardmore VOR since we're a little closer to it to find out exactly where in this area we are. So what I am going to do is I'm going to come back to our game and I'm going to get us back on course because I kind of drifted off course. I sure wish this thing had an heading hold or something like that, which would be really nice. I don't even care about altitude hold as much. I'm fine with trimming the aircraft. It's just that heading hold would be quite nice. 
You're going to see us bump up in altitude a little bit as we uh, slow down our airspeed that we gained during that turn. We're also going to get our altitude back and we'll start to slow down again on our VSI. And that'll start to level out. Anyway, let's look at our VR indicator for VR2, which is connected to that Ardmore VR. What I want to do is I want to have this two flag go directly to that VOR. So you can see it is almost directly south. It is about at a 170 degree. Uh, I'm on the 170 radial of that um, VOR. So what I'm going to do then is come over here to my DME and I'm connected to one. I'm going to connect to two. So you can see I'm 30 nautical miles away from that VOR. So what I'm going to do is again bring over Sky Vector, making sure I'm not drifting to the left again. And we're going to look at that first VOR, which is that Ardmore VOR. Now at this zoom level, I'm going to zoom out more. At the bottom, if you had an actual map, I know I've showed this to you in Season 1. I don't have it here because I'm not on the actual aeronautical chart. Anyway... Well, we'll just use the VOR for reference. Sorry about that. Uh, let's find where we were. Okay, here's Dallas. And here is Sherman. I'm just going to make sure we're not turning. We're turning a little bit. This aircraft has a tendency to lean to the left. I think its center of gravity is off to the left a little because of our extra passengers. And the pilot is on the left as well. Anyway, here is where we took off. Here is that first VOR, that Ardmore one. It is almost directly south of us, but we are on a 170. Well, right here, you can find is the north, or 360 from that VOR, and here is the 180. Anyway, if I go to that north one, come over to here, which will put us on that 170, and go about 30 miles. So here is 10 miles to the outer of this ring. Go about that same distance to here, and then again about that same distance to about here, this is where we should be, about 30 nautical miles away from that VOR on that radial, which should be right over or right past this Paulus Valley um, city with this Paulus, or Paul's Valley, excuse me, it looked like Paulus, but Paul's Valley, which there should be an airport pretty much right under us or directly behind us. And then we're just going to fly up to Norman, which is right there. So to verify our position in the sky, let's get again back on course and let's look behind us. And if I look directly behind us, well, there you go. You can see that little city and you can see that airport right there, which is that Paul's Valley Airport. So... We are basically where we thought we were. We were just just north of that Ardmore VOR, about 30 miles, right on top of that Pulse Valley Airport. So that is where we are. That is how we can use our VOR navigation to help find where we are in, uh, in re reference to a map so we can know what way we basically have to head to get to that... Uh, to that airport that we're trying to get to basically so that that is our flight plan path that is our plan we know now that in order to get to that airport from where we are we were right here at paul's valley we basically have to head this direction which is about a one oh excuse me about a three if straight north three six zero three five three four three three uh which again you can see that we're flying to connect to that bor uh which is the Will Rogers VOR, is a 3-3. And so we basically have to fly about that. So right directly in front of us almost should be Norman, Oklahoma, and the airport that we need to land at. Coming back to the DME, we're about 36 miles away from that. Um, so that is how we can know where we want to go. We're about 36 miles away from that airport. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the video one last time, and I will bring you back when we're about uh, 20 miles away from that uh, VOR, which means that we're only going to be about 10 miles. I might bring you back in about 10 miles, actually. So we're about 25 miles away from that VOR, which means that we're going to be about... 15 miles away from the airport that we are going to be landing at, which is K-O-U-N, University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport. So I'll bring you back in just a little bit.
Hello guys, we are back. As you can see, we are about 24 nautical miles away. To find out where we are, what I have done is I have turned my flag from a two flag to a from flag, and you can see we're on a on about a 140 radial away from that Will Rogers VOR at 24 miles. So what we can do is we can bring over Sky Vector again. Here's that Will Rogers VOR, here's that 140 radial, here's about 10 miles out, here's about 20 miles out, here's about 25. So right off our left, we should be at the city of Purcell, and we should see a two-lane highway right here, and train tracks below us with a river. It should be a good visual reference for where we are located. So what I can do is I can look out my left window, and I see a little city down there. Let's look out the plane below us, and you can see... Where am I? You can see that river right there. You can see train tracks, and here's that big two-lane highway right there. So we are right above that Purcell city, which means that that uh, town or Will Rogers should be right over here somewhere, and Norman should be about right here, um, roughly. And that's what we're gonna want to look for. I can see that the river banks a little, and I'm assuming that Will Rogers might be that airport right there. It's hard to tell exactly right now, but if I uh, zoom out a little on my GPS, you can see that it's pretty pretty straight ahead of us, that corn, <laughs> Cowan or whatever, K-O-U-N, uh, the University of uh, Oklahoma Westheimer Airport might be that flashing light right there. Anyway, what we are at a good altitude for our distance away from that airport is to start our initial descent. So first of all, as we talked about car heat, what you want to do before your prolonged times of uh, descent or lower power, you'll turn on your car heat. So I'm going to turn that on some. You're going to see a little drop in our tachometer. If there is any ice, this is going to clear out some of that ice from our carburetor. And you can see me slowly kind of starting to lower a little bit. Everything is looking good. That looks like that road that we crossed. And there is a um, airport right there called David J. Perry Airport, which we could kind of see um, those green lights. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my carb heat back on and I'm going to lower my throttle some. And we're going to start our initial descent. So again, I saw that airport right uh, we should see it again. There was one right over here somewhere. I think it's right there. Uh, the airport right there is that David J. Perry Airport. So off to our right right there, that should be Will Rogers right there. So what I am going to do is I've already contacted Oki City Approach. Uh, the Fort Worth Center transferred me off to them, which means that I am now with them. But what I need to do is I'm going to eventually have to re- cancel my flight following and uh, get in contact with Tower at the University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport. We're probably about seven miles away from it. I can really start to see that uh, airport. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to continue my descent and then I'm going to cancel my flight following. I'm going to have to squawk 1200. I'm going to go to my nearest airport list, and we're going to want to contact uh, that airport that we're landing at, which is University of Oklahoma Westheimer. Um, let's set our frequencies. I'm actually going to not manually set them because we got a little tight and it's hard to see it at night. Um, but the first one needs to be... Uh, automated weather. So let's tune to that quick. So I'm going to actually tune to COM1, automated weather, and we're going to get that information, get us information for the report. I'm going to tune to tower and I'm going to request a full stop landing. Tower, Papa, Hotel, Quebec, zero five, seven miles south to land. Papa, Hotel, Quebec, zero five, Westheimer Tower, entered left traffic, runway one seven, altimeter three zero zero zero. All right, left traffic.
traffic, runway 17. I'm actually going to have to start to turn. Also, I should have my seatbelt sign on. Please fasten your seatbelt. Gonna quick bring over an airport diagram for this airport. You can see that there is a runway 3 and 2 1, and then 1 7 and 3 5, which is basically north south. We're gonna be landing on runway 1 7, left traffic, which means we're gonna have to enter about like this, and then start coming up here on downwind, and then left turns to go on to runway 1 7. So that is our plan. So I'm gonna come back over here, and we kinda gotta get our bearings straight. We should see that airport coming into view shortly right there. And you can see the curved one and the long one. And that's uh, right there is going to be that runway 3. We're almost pointing north. Runway 3, 2, 1. So we're going to start turning a little like this. And eventually we'll get parallel with that airport. But I want to go a little wide because you want to enter the traffic pattern usually at about a... Uh, 45 degree angle All to the airport. Also, you can see we're still descending. The airport elevation for this airport is a little higher. It's a little closer to 1,200 feet. Um, so that means we're going to want to level off roughly at around 2,200. So we got another uh, 400 feet roughly to descend, almost 500 feet to descend. And then we'll start to give ourselves a little more power and uh, start to level off. Turned on my carb heat just for a little bit there because we were on a pretty prolonged descent. You can see that runway 3 and 2 1 very visibly now, and right there where those two flashing lights are, and you can see the glide path, uh, the Vassy lights right there, that is actually for runway 3 5, which is not where we're going to be landing on. We have a green and white flashing beacon, which means that this is a public civil airport. Uh, which means that we can land there. I'm going to start bumping up my throttle some, and you can see that we are going to start increasing our VSI closer to zero. And I'm going to start turning towards that traffic pattern now. So we can enter it at about a 4-5 uh, degree angle. Also what I'm going to do at the same time is I'm going to slowly give myself some back pressure, pulling back the throttle a little, and I'm going to start to slow myself down some, because I want to enter the traffic pattern probably around 90, 85 knots or so is about what I'm going to shoot for to enter the traffic pattern. Right there you can see some more flashing lights up there, which is basically straight to the northwest of this airport. I'm assuming that is going to be your Will Rogers Airport, the main Oklahoma City airport. But that is not the airport that we are landing at. We are landing at this University of Westheimer, uh, or University of Oklahoma Westheimer Airport, which is here. Starting to get a little low, so I'm going to give myself a little bit of throttle. And I'm going to start to turn towards the north. I'm basically entering the traffic pattern now. Making sure I don't descend too much, which I'm kind of doing right now. I don't want to be descending like that. Looking off to our left, you can see that we're basically parallel now to that airstrip that we are going to be landing on. And once we get to this point right here where those keys are, it's called the beam point. That is where we're going to enter our first degree of flaps and start slowing ourselves down a little more. We're basically at that point, so I'm going to hit my first detent of flaps. Saw the nose drop a little bit. I'm going to give myself a little more power. Cleared to land, runway 17. Alright, we are cleared to land. Good news. Cleared to land, runway 17. Papa, hotel, come back 05. Getting a little lower than I would like. You can see that Airbus right above us. That must have just took off from Oklahoma City. Right there. And once we get to about uh, to the beam point being around three-fourths of the way between our wing and our elevator, that is when we'll take our left turns, since we're in left, left traffic pattern, into base. 
So I'm going to start to turn into the base. Now I'm also going to enter my second detent of flaps. Maintaining good trim the whole time because I don't want to descend too much. And it's going to be a pretty short base. Start to level out here. You know what? I'm already going to start turning again into final which we have been approved for. We are approved to land on this runway. Enter a little bit of rudder to get a nice, good, coordinated turn going. Don't want to be slipping. And you can see we are a little low. Third detent of flaps is coming in. We have full flaps on right now. Coming in for our landing, we're going to add some power. Make sure that carb heat is off it is and now we are on a good path to land basically almost a straight headwind for us right now which is kind of nice it means we're not going to be drifting too much the winds were um, uh, 160 at 13 there we have our white light which means we're on the glide path so I'm gonna slowly pull back my throttle and I want to maintain about a 400 degree um, or 400 foot per minute uh, negative VSI, 400 foot a minute descent, which is going to keep us on that glide slope. Lights are kind of dark here, so I'm not a big fan of that. 160 at 3, we're a little high now, which means we are going to be pushed a little off to the right of this runway because it's not quite a direct uh, headwind, but it's going to be so marginal that I'm not too worried about it. I need to descend more. I'm not descending fast enough. A little high. Now we're on the glide slope. Give it a little more throttle. Nice little night landing for you guys. You can see how it is done. All right, here we come. Start to pull back my throttle some. Lift up a little bit. We'll glide a little bit. Oh, there, and right there. Nice landing. I am happy with that. We'll pull back our throttle, start to hit the brakes. Exit runway when able. All right, and let's look for a exit off this runway. It looks like the first one is going to be Charlie 1, uh, which I think might be up here. Got to travel a little bit on here. And as you can see, uh, sun is down. We got here right at dusk. Uh, it's what, 9.30 in game. So we started the flight at around what, 8.20? About an hour flight. Papa, hotel, come back to zero five. Exit runway when able. All right, I am planning on exiting the runway when able. I gotta get to, uh, well this says hotel three. That is not what my, uh, airport diagram is showing. Sorry, I'm kind of stuttering a lot. Oh boy, I cannot see. Papa, Hotel Quebec, 05. Contact ground on 121.6. One. Alright, we are going to contact ground. 121.6 one. for Papa, Hotel Quebec, 05. Westheimer Tower, Uni, X-ray, Alpha, Alpha, Tango, Alpha, ready to go, runway. All right, I'm going to request taxi to parking. Ground, Papa, hotel, come back, zero, five. Request taxi to parking. Papa, hotel, come back, zero, five. Taxi to general aviation parking. Yeah, taxi rate, hotel, three, bravo. Hotel, three, bravo. <laughs> All right. My airport diagram is updated. There is no hotel, three here, so... Uh, we're going to turn on progressive taxi because I cannot see exactly where I am. I might have gone off the uh, taxiway slightly there because I, I could not see. I cannot see the uh, 
taxiway from the ground at all. My landing lights are not doing anything to illuminate for me. I am going to continue to use them, however, as taxi lights. I am going to get penalized for it. Whatever. No, I'm going to turn them off, actually. I'll pro probably still get penalized for it, but that is all right with me. You see that my nose keeps wanting to turn to the right. That is because we have that stronger uh, tailwind. And what it's doing is it's catching the elevator and pushing it north, which is, or the rudder, excuse me, not the elevator, pushing it north, which then is causing my nose to turn to the right. So that is kind of what is going on right there. That's why my nose kept turning to the right. I hate using the progressive taxi, but it is, I, even if my airport diagram was right, I would still probably use it just because I cannot see the ground at all. Um, it is too dark and my landing lights, as you can see, were not doing anything to help me out. And then progressive taxi just changes like that. That's always nice. Alright, and we are coming to a good park spot and let's slow down and stop right here. I am fine with that. We have stopped, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my uh, parking brake, which you can see I just did right there. Let's get back into the checklist since we have landed. I did a lot of that on my own. Uh, I usually don't verbalize or vocalize uh, my takeoff checklist like I didn't do earlier or my landing checklists. Uh, same with cruise checklists. There's just too much going on at once, so I usually tend to not vocalize those. So if you wanted to hear them, I am sorry. After landing, flaps, we want to put those all the way up. I should have done that right away after I landed. Uh, strobes off. Uh, well, I don't have a strobe, so I'm going to get penalized for that as well. Transponder, we can go to... Well, we're going to just turn it off, actually. Uh, I should have done this uh, right away when I landed. But we're going to put that at off. And trim, we're going to trim for the takeoff. So we're going to come over here and trim to about seven degrees which should be about right there 7.2 we'll trim down one more notch 6.9 i like that we're gonna undo our seat belts and i'm gonna go and open the door so they can start getting out while i finish my checklist we're gonna do the shutdown checklist parking brake is set avionics will go ahead and turn those off right now Magnetos, uh, we could check them again, but I do that during my run-up, so I'm not going to check them again. Mixture, we're going to pull that all the way to cutoff. Ignition switch, we're going to turn that to the off position. Our hobs or tachometer, that's where we record our aircraft flight time and things like that, so I'm not going to be doing that right now because it is a simulation, but the game kind of does that for me. Unboarding is complete. Chocks, tie-downs, covers, we want that all on. And this checklist, one thing I don't like is it doesn't have all the electronics coming off. So I'm going to shut off my master switches. No, we're going to keep my battery on. Turn off my instrument panel. Beacon is going to stay on. Nav light's coming off. Dome light is coming off. And holy cow, I can't see. Battery switch is off again. So everything should be set. I can't see because it is pitch dark. So let's just go ahead and end our flight in FS Passengers. Flight is ended. It is mode realistic, so my flight was already registered. I had a nice landing. It was a kiss. That's a nice uh, only 122 feet per minute descent when I touched down. And I was, I was happy with that uh, landing, especially at night with uh, the lights on the side of the runway. I might have to change my lighting because it was not very bright. Uh, passenger opinion, they were very happy. I had 100% on that, and I made $5,000, uh, which is pretty nice. I don't have any other aircraft for a flight or fleet bonus yet, but that'll come in due time. My cargo, though, where is my cargo? 
cargo income plus $50 for 198 pounds. It's, I said 200 to start off with. My flight manifest said 199. I ended with 188. So some of my cabbage must have oxidized or something and released weight while in flight. Uh, no services, fuel cost, we got that, airport taxes, I'm not too worried about any of that stuff. Anyway, we made money, so let's continue to scroll down. Company reputation has increased significantly to 71.07. Overall flight results were perfect. I did have a strobe light must be activated when entering the runway. I don't have the strobe light. I'm just naturally going to get this penalty. I am fine with that. Uh, I made a very smooth landing for plus 50. Perfect flight, no problems, and very f satisfied passengers. Another 150 points, and you landed at the scheduled airport, which is always a good thing to land at the airport you say you're going to land at, especially at night flying. You can see how night flying, you can get disoriented, and it can become a lot harder to find the airport that you are going for, especially when there is not a VOR directly at that airport like there was for this one. There was not one. So uh, it actually, I hope you like this flight because there was a little added challenge not only being night but also i think it's the first flight where i never had a vor at the airport that i was landing at so it does make it a little challenging uh for your navigation but i hope you learned some on how to do that kind of navigation through your aeronautical charts i hope you learned something about carb heat i hope you like the video you guys thank you so much for watching as always if you have any questions or comments suggestions or just want to say hi please 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 send me a message or send me a comment I I love the interactivity between us. I want to keep that going. So keep sending me messages. Keep sending me comments. Get your friends to subscribe. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Because every time I see my subscriber count go higher, it makes me happier and more motivated to continue making these videos. Anyway, you guys, thank you so much for watching this flight. And I will catch you all next time.